Hello and welcome to Bay College's online lectures for college algebra. I'm Jim Helmer and in this video we're going to look at section 6.1 which deals with com composite functions or composite functions, however you want to pronounce that. The first thing we're going to look at is an application to a composite functions. We actually use composite functions all the time, we just don't think of it in algebraic terms, so to speak. Uh, one example would be, let's say, you have a utility bill that costs $100 and you make $10 an hour. Well, $10 an hour is your rate of pay. That's a function in itself. And your utility bill that comes every month, well, that's a separate function in itself. But if you put the two together, you compose one of another, you can actually say, well, I have to work 10 hours in order to pay my utility bill. So now my utility bill is a function of hours, essentially. So let's look at an example here. Uh, one application that we may have in the sciences is converting temperatures. To, uh, to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius, we have this function here that describes the relationship between the two different temperature scales. Now, Celsius as a function of Fahrenheit is 5 ninths F minus 32, where F is our temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. So if I know uh, the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, let's use 32, the freezing point. 32 minus 32 is 0, 5 ninths of 0 is 0, that would be 0 degrees Celsius. Well, in a lot of the sciences, we use the SI system of temperature, which is Celsius, or Kelvin, actually, which is the absolute temperature scale. Well, there is a function that converts Celsius to degrees Kelvin, or, well, degrees Celsius to absolute Kelvin which is 273 plus C. If I know the temperature in degrees Celsius, I can add 273 to it, and I know the temperature on the Kelvin scale, the absolute temperature scale. So if we think about it, essentially a composite function is, well, what if I want to just start with an input of F and get my output of Kelvin? Well, this is why we call it a composite function, because we're going to take one function where our input is F, and plug it in to this function, and I should call this function k of c, right? But we put in our input into one function to get our output. Now it's in degrees Celsius. We put that in, and I should have left that, I suppose, to get our degrees out in Kelvin. Well, our initial input is f, so this is actually c of f. And when I put it into here, well, now my input is actually C of F. So we have K of C of F, not Kentucky Fried Chicken, K of C, but K of C of F to get out the value in Kelvin. So there's two ways to write that. And the notation is K of C of F, where the input is F into the function of c, which is then put in to the function of k. The other way to write that would be k composed of c evaluated for f. So these are just two different notations, and we'll see that again right here. Let's say we have our generic function here. x is my input into some function g, and my output is g of x. Now I'm going to take this output and use it as input into my function f to get f of g of x, a new value that's evaluated essentially for the initial input of another function. So be aware of the notation f of g of x is the same thing as f of g of x. This doesn't mean multiplication. This is a new symbol if you're not familiar with it. It's saying composed. f is composed of g evaluated for x. Uh, one thing, I really don't care for this notation, because if we think about it, we actually have to work backwards. We're plugging x into g, and then g into the function f. Well, here, in this type of notation, we actually see that. x is the input of g, and g of x is the input into f. So you can actually see it in this notation. And if you're following along in the notes, you'll see it written in this notation. But when I do it on the board, I prefer this notation. You should get familiar with being able to recognize it either way. Let's look at some, uh, some composite functions. 
let's uh, allow f of x to be x plus 4 and g of x to be x squared minus 4. So we have these two different functions. I want to find f of g of x. Well, I'm going to rewrite it as f of g of x. Now, notice there are two different notations, but they're actually uh, spoken in the same verbiage, the same English language. f of g of x is f of g of x. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take g of x and put it into the function f of x, evaluate f for the whole function g of x. Now, if I do that, f of x is x plus 4. I'm putting this as my input, the entire function g of x, which is x squared minus 4. And if I do some simplification here, these parentheses aren't necessary. I just put them in there so I wouldn't make any sign errors or anything of that nature. And we'll see in the next examples, it's relatively important to have parentheses here. If I simplify this, well, negative 4 plus 4 just leaves me with x squared, which is a new function in itself. What if I have g of f of x? Well, this is telling me to take g and compose it of f of x. So I'm going to take the whole function f of x and put it into g. Well, g is x squared minus 4. And I'm going to compose it of f of x, take this whole function, and put it in for x. And now we see that here's where the parentheses are really necessary, because I actually have to square this. I have to foil it out. And when I do that, I get x squared plus 8x plus 16. And now I can simplify further. 16 minus 4 is 12. So this is x squared plus 8x plus 12. So this is my new function that is g of f of x. And you notice these are not the same. Even though I went f of g of x, they were composed of the two functions, the order in which they're composed makes a difference, because this is a totally different equation than that. Let's look at here. This says find f of g of 2. Now, in this notation, if we evaluate g for 2, and whatever that output is, we evaluate it for f. We're going to do that, but first, let's just use the composite function we already found. We found f of g of x to be x squared. Now I'm just going to evaluate that function at 2. So I'm taking this, which is my compos composite function, and evaluating at 2. 2 squared is 4. Now let's go the long way. Let's actually work it this way. If I put 2 into g, 2 squared is 4. 4 minus 4 is 0. That it would be my output, 0. Take that value and plug it into f. Well, 0 plus 4 is 4. The exact same answer, 4. All right, let's look at g, g of f of 2, which is f of 2 being evaluated into g. So let's actually use this function here. I'm putting 2 into x plus 8 times 2 in for the x plus 12. And when I evaluate it, I get 4 plus 16 is 20 plus 12 is 32. Now let's see if I did it this way. 2 into f. So 2 plus 4 is 6. Take that output of 6. Put it into here. 6 squared is 36. 36 minus 4 is 32. So you can see by building the composite function, if I have to evaluate it for multiple values, it's easier to put it in the composite function one time and calculate the answer instead of putting it into one function, taking that result, putting it into another function. Now, one thing you want to pay close attention to, you want to notice, that f of g of x is not the same as g of f of x. I had mentioned this before. The order makes a difference. Because f of g of x was this function, g of f of x was a totally different function. They are not the same. So the order does matter in which you put them in. Now, if by chance you did get the same result for one and the other, well, that doesn't, that's just a coincidence. It doesn't necessarily hold true in every case. All right, let's move on to determining domains of composite functions. Now, when it comes to composite functions, 
we want to determine the domain. And essentially what we want to look at is if x is in the domain of g, but we're going to take g of x and compose it into f, g of x must be in the domain of f for all values of f of g of x. Now, a lot of fancy terminology there. But essentially what it says is, if we're going to compose a function, we have to watch the domain. When we put it in, it's going to change the domain of the function. So let's, let's or it may change the domain. We're looking for an intersection. So what I want to do here is just let's first evaluate this. If we look at the domain, we see an x in the denominator. I know that x cannot equal 0 here, so this would be negative 3. x cannot equal negative 3, because that makes this undefined. So that's the domain of f of x. The domain of this function, g of x, negative 2 over x, well, I know x cannot equal 0. That's the only value in the denominator that makes that undefined. Now, let's find f of g of x. And the first thing we want to do is assess this value. We already found the domain of this to be not equal to 0. Now, if I compose that function, and let's just write it in here, 1 over x plus 3, well, I'm composing this function with that one, negative 2 over x plus 3. So this is my composite function. It's a little uh, unsimplified right now. But let's think about this. How does it change the domain? Well, g of x cannot equal the domain restriction of f of x, which would be negative 3. If I go ahead and solve this, I'll say, OK, multiply both sides by x and divide by negative 3. I get x cannot equal 2 thirds. This is a new domain restriction. It is essentially the intersection of these two functions when we compose f of g of x. And if we actually set this equal to 0, we'd end up getting the exact same equation that I wrote right here, or unequation, right? They can't equal. So what essentially our new domain is that x cannot equal the 2 thirds that we found. And because it's composed of g, it cannot be 0 either. So these are the, func or the domain restrictions of our composite functions the intersection of this one with the intersection that would make this one undefined. All right, <clears throat> so this I want this to be your quiz here. Try to do the exact same thing, but this time do it as g of f of x. We switch the order, so you're going to get a different composite function. So go ahead and try this one on your own. State the domain, and tell me what the composite function is. Uh, simplify it, and that'll help quite a bit. All right, let's look at another uh, perspective of composite functions. If we know that f of g of x is the new function h of x, and we know h of x is this quantity, let's propose some possible uh, solutions to what f of x and g of x were before we composed them. Now, one way to do that is just to assess our grouping symbols. What's within our grouping symbols? Well, x plus, or excuse me, 1 plus x squared. What is outside of this grouping symbol? Well, something cubed is what's occurring outside of that. So let's just say something, let's call it x, so that our uh, value of x stays consistent, being cubed. Well, I can think of this as the com composition of the functions. Well, this value was put in place of this value. So this is my inner function, which makes it g of x. And f of x, the outer function, and that's why I say kind of assess any grouping symbols. That'll help you narrow some of the possibilities down. Now, does this mean that this was the only solution, that g of x was 1 plus x squared and f of x was x cubed? No, there are actually several different combinations that we could have come up with. I could have said that g of x was x squared, this value right here. And f of x, the outermost function was 1 plus something that I replaced cubed, which would have been that function. So you notice these are different, and there are as yet other possibilities. But 
Essentially, we're just trying to reconstruct, reverse engineer, so to speak, when we have a function like this. So if you're working these in the textbook that corresponds to this class, realize that sometimes when you work things out, you're not going to get the same answer that's in the back of the book. It doesn't necessarily mean you have the wrong answer. It's just not the same. All right, let's look at another application of composite functions. All right, here we have a story problem where it states, a store advertises a best sale of the season with 50% off all already reduced items. If you purchase swimwear, you get an additional $5 off. If the swimwear was already 15% off, how much would a swimsuit with an original price of X dollars be on the current sale? Well, we can look at this in one of two ways. There is uh, two different functions that we see here. One that says the best sale of the season gives us 50% off. And then there's already reduced, which is already 15% off. Here's where we got to be a little bit careful. 15% off means that we're going to pay 85%. This is what we're not going to pay. So if you see that right away, you can recognize that and say, oh, well, let's change it to what I'm actually going to pay. Now, let's think of this as two different functions. What is my first function? Well, these were already reduced. Let's call these A of the x dollars. So these are my already reduced items. Well, how much are these? I'm going to pay 85%. So I'm just going to leave it as 0.85 times x. This is my function of the already reduced items. So if they weren't on sale, I'd be paying full price. Now, the best sale of the season, I'm going to use b of x. This is the best sale according to the store that's advertising this. It tells me I'm going to get 50% off already reduced items. Well, 50% off any input. And I, I could write it as 0.5, but I'll write it as 1 half x. Now, you notice we have two functions here. We have to realize what's being composed of what. Well, we have items that are already reduced. They have to come first, right? Because they have to be reduced before we get any additional amounts off. So a is my first function, but I'm going to compose b of that function because we want to know what the price is going to be on the current sale, well, a swimsuit with an original price of x. We don't worry about this uh, $5 off. That's actually extraneous information in here. We just say, well, what if I bought some other item of x dollars? What would I actually pay? Well, if we do this composition of functions, we're saying b composed of a of x. If we think about it, we have an item that's going to be reduced, and then we're going to take an additional amount off. So we have our composite function. And when I put this, compose it into here, I get 1 half of 0.85 of x. And I could do a little bit of simplifying and write this as 0.425. Let's do that. So whatever swimsuit I purchase, I can then plug it into here and say, this is what the original price of that swimsuit was. Now, I could also determine with this given information, if it asked me to, but it didn't. It just said, what was the original price of x? It wanted us to build that composite function. But I could find out what the original price of the swimsuit that I got $5 off was. Well, half of $5 gives me $5. That means the original price was $10. And if, uh, well, the original price was $10 after this deduction. So I could set this equation equal to the $10. That's the sale price. And then solve for x. And I'm going to get like $11 and some change. So the original price of the item was $11 and, I don't know, 70, 40, some cents, something like that. So this has been uh, section 6.1. Introduction to Composite Functions. Thank you for watching.